Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is part three of a four-part series on the solar system. We'll talk about how we've explored the solar system and look at some of the uncrewed robotic missions and what they've found. In parts one and two, we looked at the objects in the solar system, the size of the solar system and how orbits work. In part four, we'll consider how the solar system formed. There have been thousands of successful rocket launches to space since the first in the 1950s. This picture shows how crowded the space around Earth has got. Some missions have been crewed, and over 500 astronauts have gone to space so far, although only 24 have left Earth orbit to visit another celestial body, the Moon, and only 12 landed there. See my video, The Moon Apollo Missions, if you'd like to learn more. Most spacecraft are uncrewed satellites in Earth orbit, mostly for communications, but hundreds of space probes have left our planet to explore other destinations in our solar system. Today we'll look at the four main types of space probe, with one or two examples of each. These are flybys, orbiters, landers and impactors. Before we do that, let's consider how you get there, and address a common misconception about space travel. It takes a lot of energy, and therefore fuel, to get to another planet. But why? If you drive to another town on Earth, you need to use fuel constantly to overcome friction and air resistance. So the further you go, the more fuel you have to use. But this isn't true in space. In fact, you can travel 940 million kilometres in one year just by staying home and riding the Earth around the Sun. In part one of this series, we explained that objects in different orbits travel at different velocities. You need a certain amount of energy to change your velocity, and so change your orbit. But astronomers and rocket scientists find it easier just to talk about the change in velocity, rather than energy, needed to change orbit. We call this delta V. Let's consider a trip from Earth to Mars, which involves three main steps. These diagrams are not to scale, except for the sizes of the orbits, and they're greatly simplified. For instance, the orbits here are shown as circles, rather than ellipses. But even real mission planners will often start with a simplification like this. Step 1 is getting from Earth's surface into orbit. This takes a lot of energy, including some to overcome atmospheric drag. Delta V is about 9.4 km per second. Step 2 is changing your orbit. We don't travel in straight lines in space. We use a Hofmann transfer orbit, which has perihelion at Earth and aphelion at Mars. We need to reach Earth's escape velocity, which takes a delta V of 3.2 km per second, and add further velocity to get to Mars, another 1.1 km per second, a total velocity change of 4.3 km per second. Now we just wait. We turn the engines off and let the Sun's gravity pull us along the orbit for 260 days until we reach Mars. We don't use any fuel for this longest part of the journey. Step 3 is to enter orbit around Mars. Our spacecraft arrives at Mars travelling so fast it will just zip right past, so we need to slow it down. To reach a low orbit, just above the atmosphere, takes a delta V of 1.4 km per second. If we want to land, we need another 3.8 km per second, but we can use atmospheric drag to reduce our fuel use. This is summarised in this graph. Most of the energy is needed just to reach Earth orbit. Once you're there, most of the rest is needed to escape Earth's gravity. The energy needed to enter a Hoffman transfer orbit varies depending on the orbit of your destination, but is generally the smallest part of this equation, especially for the inner planets. The energy needed to land on Mars is less than shown here, because a lander can use atmospheric braking, and an orbiter doesn't need to do this at all. So the main reason it takes more energy to reach Mars than to get into orbit around Earth is that you need to escape Earth's gravity you need to reach escape velocity. So, now that we know how to get there, let's see what we can do. We'll start with the simplest space probe, the flyby. These just fly by an object, without stopping. When a space probe reaches its destination, it's travelling very fast. It would take a lot of fuel to slow it down and enter orbit, so often we don't bother. We can use the fuel saved to give it a speed boost and get it to its destination faster or replace the excess fuel with additional scientific instruments. A flyby space probe can also visit multiple locations. This animation shows the path of Voyager 2, which flew by all four giant planets after it launched in 1977. Spacecraft can also use a flyby to gain speed. It will pass close to another planet, such as Jupiter, on its way to its destination. 
It steals a tiny fraction of the planet's orbital kinetic energy and gets a big speed boost for itself. This is called a gravity assist, or sometimes a slingshot manoeuvre. If you're here for the Astronomy GCSE, you need to know about five missions. I'll discuss them, and there's a summary sheet of what you need to know at the end of the video. Our flyby example is New Horizons. It launched from Earth in 2006, used the gravity assist at Jupiter in 2007, and went on its way to its target, Pluto. New Horizons flew by Pluto in 2015 at 84,000 km per hour and reached 50,000 km above the surface. It took many photographs and scientific measurements with a total of 6.25 gigabytes of information, including detailed maps of Pluto and its five moons, and analysis of Pluto's temperature, atmosphere, and the effect of the solar wind. New Horizons was 5 billion kilometers from Earth when it reached Pluto. At this distance, it could only transmit data at 2,000 bits per second. It took 15 months to finish sending all the data. And just this photo of Sputnik Planum and an unnamed mountain range took 15 minutes. Next up, orbiters. These reach their destination and slow down to enter long-term orbit. They usually slow down entirely by using fuel, but if their target has an atmosphere, they can use that, sending the spacecraft into the thin upper atmosphere for a brief time using aerobraking to help it slow down. Orbiters stay at their destination much longer than flybys and can gather much more data. They might enter an eccentric orbit to observe their target from different heights. They can observe their target over time identifying changes such as weather patterns, or taking more detailed readings from potentially interesting areas. And in a complex system, such as Jupiter or Saturn, they can sometimes move to a different nearby target, for example to analyse moons or rings. Sputnik 1 was the first spacecraft and orbited the Earth in 1957. We look at two orbiters, starting with Juno. Juno has been in a polar orbit around Jupiter since 2016. It is powered by three solar arrays, these are enormous because Jupiter is so far from the Sun, and sunlight at Jupiter is only 4% as intense as on Earth. Juno has been analysing Jupiter's structure, with the aim of helping us understand how Jupiter and the rest of the solar system formed. Juno will measure the amount of water in Jupiter, and the mass of its core. It is also mapping Jupiter's magnetic and gravitational fields and its atmosphere. Juno has no human crew, but it does have the only Lego outside of Earth, in the form of three minifigures. Galileo, the Roman god Jupiter, and the Roman goddess Juno. Dawn was the first spacecraft to visit a dwarf planet, a few months before New Horizons reached Pluto. It visited the asteroid Vesta, and then went on to visit the dwarf planet Ceres, where it ran out of fuel and continues to orbit in a highly elliptical orbit that takes it just 35 kilometres above the surface. Dawn has mapped Ceres in astonishing detail, at 140 metres per pixel. It analysed strange bright spots on Ceres, and its gamma ray and neutron detectors discovered organic molecules, salt, and even evidence of occasional liquid water flows on the surface. Dawn has helped us better understand the formation of the terrestrial planets. Dawn was the first spacecraft to use ion propulsion. Electrical power from its solar panels accelerates xenon ions, rather than using chemical reactions. Ion engines give much lower thrust, but the fuel lasts much longer. Dawn's engines ran for a total of 5.9 years. An impactor is a two-part spacecraft. The spacecraft enters orbit around a body, or sometimes just performs a flyby, and one part separates and deliberately crashes into the surface. The impactor lands at a specified location with a precisely known momentum. It causes an earthquake, and the orbiting probe measures the results, typically using radar or lasers. This helps us determine the interior structure of the object. An impactor will also throw up material from and just below the surface. If the orbiting probe is close enough, it can analyse the chemical composition of the debris as it passes through. Impactors are only really useful on bodies with little or no atmosphere to slow them down. After Apollo 12 lifted off from the Moon, the crew crashed their ascent stage onto the Moon. The seismometers they'd left on the surface recorded the resultant vibrations. In the words of planetary scientist Clive R. Neal, the Moon was ringing like a bell. In 2005, Deep Impact was sent to Comet Temple 1. This was a flyby mission, and just before reaching the comet, it fired its impactor, a 372kg probe, which struck the comet at 37,000km per hour, creating a 150 meter wide crater. 
the impactor had a camera, and you can see its view here as it approached the comet. A huge plume of debris was thrown up, and the flyby spacecraft took high-resolution images and spectroscopy of the plume. The results were surprising. The fine powder showed that Temple 1 is much less dense than expected, being about 75% empty space. We have updated our understanding of how comets formed based on these results. Having succeeded in its primary mission, Deep Impact went on to study several other comets, but without the impactor. A Russian astrologer sued NASA over this, alleging that the impact had ruined her horoscope. She lost. And now we come to the last type of probe, landers, which land softly and intact on another body. Hopefully. Landing may be done with retro rockets to slow down, or with parachutes for targets with an atmosphere. Some use airbags to cushion the fall, and Mars landers may use all of these. This artist's impression shows a sky crane used to land Curiosity on Mars. A lander can do much more than a flyby or orbiter. It can take photos from very close up, measure seismic events, and perform chemical and spectroscopic analysis of the surface and atmosphere. Landers are typically stuck where they land, but wheeled rovers have operated on the Moon and Mars. Lunacod 1 and 2 achieved astonishing speeds on the Moon of 2 km per hour. Landing is very difficult with a high rate of failure. Control signals from Earth suffer light lag, with radio signals taking minutes or hours, so uncrewed landers have to rely on sensors and software. Buzz Aldrin reacted to unexpected events when landing on the Moon, but robotic landers can't react to anything that wasn't anticipated by its programmers. Mars is notorious for killing more than half of attempted landers. Past problems include retro rockets cutting out too early, parachutes failing to deploy or landing on top of the lander, or the lander landing the wrong way up. Verena 14, which landed on Venus, successfully measured the properties of the camera's lens cap rather than the planet's surface. This picture shows a model of what we think happened to Beagle 2. It landed successfully on Mars, but its solar panels and antenna failed to deploy. Our lander example is Philae, the first spacecraft to land on a comet, 67P Trivium of Gerasimenko. It travelled there with an orbiter, Rosetta, in 2014. Comets have very low gravity, so Philae was supposed to attach itself with harpoons and a thruster. Both of these failed to operate, and Philae bounced off the surface twice, eventually landing in a crevice at the wrong angle. Here, the solar panels couldn't recharge the batteries, and the lander's drill couldn't reach the surface to analyse it. Nevertheless, Philae survived. Scientists managed to manoeuvre it a bit and got some good data. They learned that the comet's surface was very tough, not soft and fluffy as expected. Philae also detected 16 organic compounds, including several that had never before been found on a comet. Here is a summary of the advantages and disadvantages of these four types of space probe. You should be prepared to discuss comparisons of different space probes in the GCSE exam. Lastly today, we'll talk about the most versatile of scientific instruments, humans. Humans can react to unexpected events, solving problems and taking advantage of unexpected opportunities. They can react immediately, rather than waiting for commands from mission control, and can make movements that robots just can't. And human spaceflight is exciting, for the astronauts and for the public. On the other hand, humans need life support air, water and food. The humans themselves also add a lot of mass, meaning more fuel. And of course, space is dangerous. Humans can die due to accident, and zero gravity presents various health problems such as space adaptation sickness and degradation of bones, muscles and the heart. It takes days to reach the moon, but months to get anywhere else, and no human has yet travelled past the Earth-Moon system. And that's it for today. In part four, we'll talk about how gravity formed and continues to shape the solar system. These two summary screens are designed to be printed as cards. If you go to the Google slide, linked in the description, you can print these screens double-sided, with advantages and disadvantages on one side and examples on the other. You can do the same for human versus robotic missions. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and have an excellent day.